Oops. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's begin. Good, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, and a warm welcome to this um, policy dialogue organized by the European Policy Center in cooperation with the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group, otherwise known as BIAPAG, to discuss about uh, the green energy transition in the Western Balkans. Uh, for the countries of the region, moving towards renewables and towards um, more environmentally sustainable uh, practices is part of the work that must be done if they are to come closer to the European Union. So how are they getting on with the task? Uh, what do their energy sectors look like? What are some of the key obstacles uh, to achieving energy transition uh, in the region? In particular, what role do foreign actors and recent crisis, especially um, the war in Ukraine, play in this effort? And what does public opinion in different Balkan countries reveal about the subject? To make sense of the geopolitics um, of the green energy transition um, in the region, a team of BIABAG researchers have developed a project that uh, is being implemented um, this year. And a few of them are with us here today uh, to tell us all about the important work that they're doing, but also to share with us uh, some preliminary findings. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Florian Bieber, professor at Graz University and BIAPAG coordinator, uh, Dimitar Bechev, lecturer at Oxford University and visiting scholar at Carnegie, Nicolas Tsipakis, uh, professor at the University of uh, Peloponnese, and last but certainly not least, Tana Prelec, research associate at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Many thanks to all of you for agreeing to speak here today. As ever, um, I will have an exchange uh, with the panelists and then I will open the floor for questions and comments from you in the audience. And at the very end, we will all have the opportunity to continue our conversation over some refreshments which are offered uh, right here next door. But until then, let's delve um, into the topic. And I'd like to start uh, from Florian, kindly asking him to tell us maybe a little bit more about the rationality of this project, but also some of its objectives. Great, thank you very much, Corinna. And it's always great to be here at EPC. Um, and yes, so this is a is a a, a project which uh, we we initiated uh, some months ago. So this is the first, in a certain way, a public presentation of our first findings. Um, we have done a baseline study, which you'll hear a little bit about from Dimitar Bechev, which outlines really uh, the lay of the land when it comes to the question of energy, green transition, and uh, external geopolitical actors. And then we have done a, a comprehensive regional survey of public attitudes, which we'll hear afterwards um, uh, in the next uh, presentations. So. BIAPAC has been looking at the role of global actors in the Western Balkans for a number of years now. Uh, we published a first policy brief in 2019 and uh, a more in-depth academic study, which looked at the role of different geopolitical actors and their role and their footprint and the impact uh, in the Western Balkans. Unlike many others who have often framed it in a terms of global antagonism and the meddling of foreign actors, we've always been very careful to point out that a lot of it relies on local gatekeepers and the role of local actors in securing and using and maybe even also abusing uh, these larger geopolitical uh, confrontations. Now, both in the light of the war in Ukraine and the Russian aggression against Ukraine and the connected energy questions, um, as well as the prevalence and high uh, toll for health in the Western Balkans due to pollution has given this topic a particular, uh, a particular relevance in the angle of the energy transition. Um, if you visit any Balkan capital um, in winter, uh, the air is often hard to breathe. And of course, it has something to do with energy, energy transition. Um, but also, uh, since the war began last year, the question of dependency on uh, Russian gas on other resources are relevant for the region as well and have not been fully addressed and resolved. So 
all of this together is really the motivation for our research. And so today we're going to, in a certain way, present to you what, how we see, this, in a certain way, the developments and the situation on the ground. And based on that, in the coming months, we will be working on um, strategies of especially how both the European Union as well as governments in the Western Balkans can address those challenges to come. So I'll close with that and I'll hand over to my colleagues to present more details of the research we've conducted so far. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Florian, for setting the stage for us. Um, then we shall move directly into the meat of the matter. Um, and I'll invite Dimitar, you uh, authored a um, baseline study, uh, which looks like this. Uh, I think there's a couple of copies on the table, but um, the paper will be available also or is available already on BIAPAG's website. Um, and, and this work is, um, is actually seeking to um, prepare the ground for all the research that will be carried um, uh, hands forth. What are some of the key messages that you would like to convey from, from, from this to our audience here today? Thank you, Corinna, and let me reiterate how uh, great of a pleasure it is to be here in this uh, in this hall. I've been uh, part of many panels, obviously, before the COVID pandemic, and it's good to uh, be back at uh, EPC. Um, my task here is just to give you lots of crunchy data and to inundate you with uh, all these details. I I plead guilty from the get go, and I'll try to be as synthetic uh, as possible. Um, why are we uh, interested in the subject of uh, foreign meddling in the energy sector? Well, because if you look at the headlines over a period of what, what maybe 15 years, there's always Russia there, even before the Ukrainian invasion. Um, the first time people uh, realized it's a big issue was in 2009, when uh, the Western Balkans were on the receiving end of the first cutoff. Uh, uh, I mean, it was the second cutoff, sorry, uh, uh, during uh, this dispute between Gazprom enough to gas of, of uh, Ukraine, and then it uh, dawned on everybody that Russia is very much uh, supplying hydrocarbons on a big scale to, to the Western Balkans. Of course, the acquisition of a Serbian national oil company the year before also sent some alarm bells ringing. Uh, and ever since we've discussed energy, I'm afraid that many people who discuss energy are um, bifurcated in different communities. You have the international relations people, uh, people, and I'm probably part of this crowd, and then you have the technical experts who might have a very different take uh, on some of the issues in hand. So what this study tries to do, uh, I'm, I'm hopefully in a relatively credible way, is to bring those bodies of knowledge uh, together. I mean, the other reason that we care about energy is that China has made an appearance with Belt and Road uh, Initiative, providing law interest rate loans, especially over the past decade to countries like Montenegro, uh, Bosnia, and Serbia. And of course, uh, road infrastructure has been in the at the forefront, but also coal burning power stations have attracted uh, this sort of funding. And there is a good reason uh, why they would uh, be of interest both to China, but also to regional elites. And I'll come back to this point. So the temptation, though, uh, and I very much agree with Florian, I tried to convey this point here, is just to look at energy from a top-down perspective and reduce everything to China is doing this, China is doing that, that Russia is, is meddling. Uh, whereas actually, I mean, to understand the energy sector, you have to understand the political economy uh, of the Western Balkans and also the historical legacy. Why is it that a former Yugoslavia depends on Ignite Coal? Well, because that was the available resource when uh, um, there was industrialization in the post-Second World War period and uh, where you had urbanization and electricity could be derived in a relatively problem-free way to investigate coal and other people were doing that as well. Uh, why is it that Albania relies on hydropower? Well, because they didn't have the know-how, the expertise, and the capital to develop a coal-burning sector, unlike, say, uh, Yugoslavia or, or Bulgaria, or indeed Greece uh, in, in this part of the world. So this is what the first point. Think about history, how we got, got here. Second point, why is it so difficult to change things uh, in, in this sector uh, in particular? Why is it the inertia? 
Well, there is inertia because the incentives for the main players are uh, skewed. For your average Balkan government, you want to please your constituents and you don't want to meddle uh, in the sector because in the short term that might create commotion, might create instability and might uh, see the prices going up. Uh, and that will be costly even in regimes that are not very accountable. I mean, uh, people care about, about that. Uh, also, you have constituencies who depend on, on relatively cheap or subsidized electricity derived from a mostly lignite coal. And then you have, of course, the EU pushing for change uh, because uh, EU has put at the very front uh, of its agenda in the region, uh, the green transition. Um, it has put forward some money, not a lot, compared to member states in this neck of the woods, but some money has made also governments to commit through various institutions, uh, be it the Berlin process or also the um, energy community. But there's not much follow-up if you think about um, what has been done uh, in the region. So prime ministers go to those forums, including the city, they say green transition is great, we want some investment, we want to move things forward, and people in Belgrade or Sarajevo will be happy if their air is, is cleaner. But actually, they don't want to change the system because it will be uh, it create political problems at home, and, and to the extent that the EU is, has not really pushed uh, with carrots and sticks, it's not very likely that uh, in the short term uh, things will change. And secondly, um, you have the phenomenon of state capture, that those big state companies that are there to provide essentially public goods in the form of uh, reliable and, and relatively cheap energy supply tend to be um, open to predatory interests of people who tend to be close to the state. So if you put all that together, you understand why we have stasis uh, in the sector. That might change going forward because the EU is getting serious about it. And you know, you, you, many of you live in Brussels, you don't need to be told that. And there's the carbon border just a mechanism which will kick in a, in a big way uh, in a few years' time, which will put uh, governments in the bogus under pressure. And some of them have been adjusting. Montenegro is a front runner. Um, and there will be also incentives to invest into renewables because renewables are cheaper now. And for businesses, that creates uh, opportunities to generate funding. And also, it, I must say, it generates opportunities for politicians to enrich themselves by being involved in, in, in the renewables business. So the green transition is not necessarily going to do away with, 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 with state capture. So this is my message. Think about the, the constellation of domestic interests inertia and, and who benefits and, and who are the agents of change uh, in, in the region. Uh, and it's not very easy to find those right now. It might be different over time. And uh, it's very likely that the EU will uh, be, be, be putting pressure. Now, my the sub subject of this paper, and I guess some of you have come here, is uh, the foreign actors, how they feature uh, in this story. Well, I think the role of Russia is overhyped. So let's put my heart, cards on, on the table. Um, many journalists and experts, especially those coming from the world of politics, look at natural gas uh, in, in the region. But natural gas is not such an important resource uh, for the Western Balkans. Think about Hungary that consumes maybe three, four times more gas on an annual basis. Uh, than Serbia. And of course, you have dependency, but you have very low volumes consumed in the region. And chances are that going forward, there'll be even less. Even Serbia is now um, trying to diversify away from Russia with the interconnection uh, to Bulgaria and eventually to Greece um, that uh, will allow uh, it to actually bring gas uh, from elsewhere. And the rest of the region, mostly uh, North Macedonia and Bosnia, are consuming very small amounts or relatively negligible amounts. But having said that, um, the energy business being what it is, um, this kind of resource provides rents that could be redistributed in a clientelistic manner. So it's not to underplay gas as a, as a way to, to do business. And gas is very much traded uh, in a state 
on a state-based level because the sector hasn't been liberalized uh, in the Western Balkans. But uh, one message is, yeah, Russia is there, but it's there for a reason because uh, local gatekeepers uh, allow it to be influential. And it's about the way of doing business with big state companies uh, first and foremost. Um, second message about gas uh, is that a lot of governments have seen gas as a transition fuel, but now with the renewables becoming so much more of an attractive option, probably there won't be that much gas coming into the region and there won't be this gas revolution because even the horizon for gas is pretty limited. Um, right now, maybe only North Macedonia is into this um, mindset that you have to replace coal uh, with gas. Now, moving to China, uh, before I conclude um, uh, with maybe a few words about Turkey. Well, China has invested um, or provided um, uh, those loans, uh, but it has also seen blowback uh, because this has become politicized as well, and China is seen uh, as a problem. Secondly, Belt and Road is being retrenched, so there's not much money going uh, around uh, anymore. Uh, and finally, China might become even more important on the side of renewables. First of all, it's providing technology as a global leader uh, in uh, various renewable technologies, starting from solar panels, uh, of course. Um, uh, so I don't think there'll be a Chinese domination of the Balkan energy sector. But again, in the short term, what I described is the system of, of recycling money and then uh, feeding into the sort of clientelistic setup in the Balkans uh, applies uh, uh, very much. Um, now, Turkey is a, a somewhat different case, at least in my reading. Um, geopolitically, it positions itself as yet another external power trying to compete with the EU. But many of the policies in Turkey itself are in line with EU's preferences. For example, um, it's very likely now that they will unbundle their gas sector, Botash, uh, being finally uh, disaggregated. Uh, Turkey is moving also to renewables itself, first of all, because it signed up to the Paris Climate Accords. Um, and, uh, and secondly, because the cross-border, the carbon border adjustment mechanism will affect them as well as it affects the Western Balkans. Um, and finally, because Turkish, the Turkish private sector is interested in developing renewable capacity and also investing in, in, in the Western Balkans, places like Kosovo and North Macedonia. But having said that, the dark side of Turkey is that uh, it op knows how to operate in this sort of semi-transparent environment in the Western Balkans. And Turkish companies have basically made inroads based on special relationship of, of the government and Erdogan personally with, with, with local leaders. So it's a mixed picture there as well. But I guess I'll stop here. But again, at the risk of uh, boring you to that, just to reiterate the point that it's all about the domestic level and the set of relationships around the sector. Um, but also um, to say that um, it might not be the case in five, 10 years, because first of all, probably there'll be more pressure from below uh, on environmental issues, on green transition. Uh, it might be cheaper, actually, to produce uh, electricity from, uh, and it's already becoming cheaper uh, in countries where we have carbon tax and, and those um, uh, trading schemes in, in, in the EU. Uh, and thirdly, because the EU is likely to uh, push very hard, if not for other reasons, because we have the problem of carbon leakage from the Western Balkans and the problem of uh, uneven playing field that you have uh, dirty electricity coming from the region uh, and competing with uh, European uh, producers and also generating um, all those uh, environmental externalities. Thank you so much. Um, perhaps two uh, quick follow-up questions. One, um, what role is there for the United States, if any? Um, and second, if I understand correctly, there's good news for the green transition but maybe not such good news for um, the local gatekeepers and for the um, democratic situation in those countries, let's, let's say. And in that sense, um, if perhaps things are likely to change for a variety of, of reasons uh, in, in the energy sector, um, how is the local context and the situation likely to impact um, 
in a, the, the new green environment and, and it, perhaps the relation is circular, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't believe there'll be bad news for the local gatekeepers. Yeah. <laughs> because I mean, at the end of the day, it's about subsidies and about economic opportunities yeah. uh, with the green transition. It's not only a cost for them, it's also a source of, um, of, of money. And I, I'm sure there will be a, a lot of policy and institutional capture. They will just readjust. Okay. We've seen people who have been over their careers very flexible. I don't need to name names there. So I, I don't, I'm not concerned about them. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll prosper. It's just that maybe, you know, that will be a more sustainable way forward for societies because of the problem with coal. But, and I'm, I'm sure also there'll be resistance uh, if there is real political will, say in Serbia, to start closing mines and, and phasing out coal and, uh, and, and, and rejigging all those uh, power stations. What was achieved in Greece uh, very rapidly, by the way. I mean, it's, Greece is a, is a regional leader on, on renewables uh, uh, remarkably. So, so I, I don't think it's, it's as simple, unfortunately. Uh, regional elites will, will find a way forward. Um, US. Well, the US is really keen on gas because it takes this geopolitical approach and sees Russia wielding this um, this instrument. And it has done some good work. I mean, the 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 energy terminal in Alexandropolis, which will be supplying the region um, in the near future, uh, is backed by US diplomacy, uh, very much so. But the problem with the US very often, and for a good reason, is that they like to talk the geopolitical talk, but it's not follow up from business. So it's not that somebody will come to Kosovo and invest on a grand scale to bring gas, uh, because that's in line with the US policy. It's just not a hospitable environment, and it's a very small market to make money. So I don't think this drive to bring gas into the Balkans will be there um, over a longer period of time. Um, and also, again, renewables are competitive uh, in, in the region. They're, they're probably cheaper and they provide more sustainable energy. The problem is that to bring in renewables in a credible way, you have to undo a lot of blockages domestically and you have to invest into infrastructure. Uh, and if investment is short and the, the EU is not as generous in the Western Balkans as, as it's elsewhere, and we are likely to see adjustment, which, as many things in the Western Balkans, drags on over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, and maybe to, to specify that um, this research will now serve as a basis for further investigations and uh, various researchers, some of which are actually uh, listening into our discussion online. Um, different other researchers from, from BIAPAG are going to undertake uh, for specific countries in the regions. Um, we're covering uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Albania, Kosovo. Um, yes, Albania and Kosovo. Um, so there's more to come. Uh, stay tuned for that. But for now, uh, and as Florian has anticipated, um, uh, a big part of, uh, of, of this um, project has also been uh, this public opinion poll that was carried out in, um, I think, um, April, May this, this year. March, April. March, March, April this year. Um, and it was carried out in all of the Balkan countries. And Nikos and Tena will, um, well, Nikos will uh, present this absolutely brand new data uh, that, um, that has come out. And, and Tena will um, try to interpret a bit the, um, um, the results. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass the floor to Nikos and, and then uh, with Tena will follow directly on. Uh, thanks a lot, Corina. Thanks a lot uh, to many thanks to EPC for hosting us here and for all of you being with us here and uh, uh, hear this research and also react to the findings. Uh, very quickly, the identity of the survey, it was uh, conducted by Kandar. Uh, it has a representative sample of 4,000 people uh, per country, so six, more than 6,000 people in the region. And it was, uh, it was carried out, the field work was carried out in March, uh, April. Uh, so this is the first uh, uh, presentation. It was carried out by the phone with the CATI method. And uh, we have more than 100 graphs. We are still digging and uh, through cross-tabulation 
where, where I'm covering more and more findings. Uh, in the limited time of this presentation, I will show you 11 slides with some of the most important findings that concern either what the people in the region think about the environment or what they think about external actors, those external actors that uh, also Dimitar mentioned earlier, who have an activity and they have a role to play in the energy transition. Without, you, without further delay, we can start. Can I ask the next slide, please? Ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is a general question. We're asking people uh, which of this problem is more concerning to them personally, and we have presented them with uh, with uh, several uh, questions, uh, such as um, questions that deal with democracy, the rule of law in the region, and also uh, the economic situation, and also about the environment. Very quickly and very briefly, we are seeing that most of the people, approximately uh, the, from 40 to 80 percent. Uh, are reacting in throughout the region and saying that the main concern is economic hardship. And when they are mentioning a second concern, this is corruption or in the case of Albania, the state of democracy. On the other hand, if we look at environmental problems, such as climate change and uh, environmental degradation, uh, they were mentioned by very few people. So, so far, the environmental agenda is not very high in the, uh, among the concerns of the people in the region. Can we move to the next slide, please? Now, we ask precisely which is uh, their main, main environmental concern. And here, unsurprisingly, in all countries, with the exception of Albania, they cited air pollution. We know that air pollution is uh, correlated with uh, the operation of dated and obsolete uh, thermal power plants, as opposed to Albania that uh, has hydro power plants. So this is, in some, we think that in some way this is reflected where all across the region, with the exception of Albania, the first concern of the people is air pollution, followed by the rest of uh, problems that we mentioned so far. Uh, we can move to the next uh, slide, please. Here we ask precisely how people in the region think that uh, their country should respond to the energy crisis. And we have been um, uh, happy to remark that everywhere, uh, from 54 to 77 percent of people are citing a need to move to domestic production, to domestic uh, renewable energy resources, as opposed to uh, pipelines to bring uh, uh, new pipelines that will transfer oil and gas to the region, or to, to the further discoveries and further exploitations of domestic uh, pro of uh, uh, domestic or fossil fuels such as oil, uh, gas, and coal. So more or less uh, between uh, half and uh, between 54 and 80 percent in the region are expecting, in the context of the energy crisis, their countries to move to uh, more renewable energy resources. We can move to the next uh, slide, please, which, which is a similar question, but here we are giving a, a larger time framework. We are asking, in their opinion, what, what should their countries should do by 2050, which is a year target uh, set by several international documents. Uh, uh, to achieve decarbonization and uh, move to, uh, to renewable energy. We are seeing that uh, even higher percentage across the region, all over in all of these countries, from 61 to 75 percent, are saying that they are expecting their countries to move to renewable energy. And uh, there are very small uh, uh, percentage of people mentioning uh, fossil fuels or nuclear energy uh, as alternative choices. We can go to the next slide, please. This is a standard question that we are used in most surveys in the region. The purpose that we needed here is because uh, the EU is the main agent of transformation and the main actor that requests the green energy transition. As previous surveys, we noticed that in Albania and in Kosovo, nine out of 10 people are supporting uh, the, the EU accession of their country. I may add, although we don't see it in this graph, that the same picture is among uh, Bosniaks and Croats in Bosnia. It's approximately 88 percent. The same is the picture of Albanians in North Macedonia. On the other hand, this is uh, one more survey where we see that the Serbs have uh, lost appetite for EU accession. In Serbia, there is a 45 percent of people against EU accession as opposed to 41 in favor. We are seeing a similar partner pattern sorry, among the Serbs of Bosnia and the Serbs of Montenegro, also the Serbs of Kosovo, but the sample is very small in the case of the Serbs of Kosovo. We can move to the next slide, please. Here there is a precise question about um, what do the people think of reforms in the energy system of their countries? 
Um, although we, this is a very straight question, and we're asking the people to, uh, to assess uh, EU uh, requirements in the energy sector, we're thinking that maybe most of, most of the respondents did not know exactly what the EU expect from the country. So my understanding is that we should read this, uh, graph, this, uh, this graph as a, a reply on um, how much is the accession fatigue in the region. And this is because we see that uh, requiring too much is uh, among is the reply uh, is larger in Serbia, 49%. It is um, in North Macedonia, 44%. And it is very important in Kosovo because we may notice that several people in Kosovo did not reply. So among, among the respondents, almost the half say that the EU requires too much, as opposed to those that say that the EU uh, requires, uh, ad has adequate requirements or requires too little. So I think that this graph is not very helpful for the environment or for the energy precisely. And it shows that there is some accession fatigue for obvious reason in North Macedonia because of a delayed start of accession negotiation. In Kosovo, due to a delayed visa liberalization and in Serbia, uh, that there is a general uh, mood and uh, a, a perception towards the EU. We can move to the next slide, please, which is about uh, Russia. This is a question about the responsibility for the war in Ukraine. It is an important measure to see uh, on, uh, on the attitudes towards Russia. And again, we're seeing a pattern that other recent surveys have uh, observed. Uh, all, most of the people, almost everybody in Albania, and most of the people in Kosovo think that uh, uh, Russia is to blame for the war in Ukraine, as opposed to respondents from Serbia, where the vast majority uh, put the blame on the West, the EU and NATO. And also we're seeing a similar pattern of replies uh, among Serbs of Montenegro, Serbs of Bosnia, uh, uh, so far. So can we move to the next slide, please? Where, is, where, is, where there are, we have uh, questions about um, external actors. We have a few slides about external actors and their uh, contribution to uh, sup energy supplies in the region. This question is about uh, energy security. and has to do whether where their country, to, who, to whom their country should rely more for its energy supplies. Uh, we're seeing that um, uh, in the cases of um, Albania, of North Macedonia, of uh, Bosnia and Montenegro, there is much expectations from the EU. In the case of Kosovo, there is slightly higher expectations from the United States. And here on this graph, Serbia is an outlier. Uh, the, there are expectations they, uh, for, for the, its energy supplies to rely on Russia. We can understand this finding because uh, Vucic, President Vucic has made a lot of, has repeatedly mentioned the contract that, uh, for instance, Serbia has secured uh, the privileged contract of, for the supply of gas from Russia for three years. So we see that uh, uh, for when we talk about energy security, the Serbs are thinking that the countries rely more on Russia as opposed to the rest of the countries where there is a preference for the EU or in Kosovo slightly more the United States. We can move to the next slide, please. And this is the question of energy transition. Who is helping more your country to achieve energy transition? Here we are seeing a more uniform uh, picture uh, where all of the countries are expecting more assistance from the EU. We understand that the uh, uh, energy transition requires funds, requires a, a transfer of technology and know-how. Uh, there is a, a greater expectation in Albania. We're seeing this in all the graphs, but even in Serbia and everywhere, we're seeing that most, uh, most expectations are for assistance from the EU and its members. I would like that you notice on this graph a second uh, finding, and this is generally, we're seeing it also in other graphs, that uh, there is much support for regional cooperation. We're seeing that the neighboring Western Balkan countries is a second uh, choice for, for respondents for most of the countries. So there is an expectation in the region that regional cooperation can help uh, uh, first phase, phase the energy crisis and second, uh, move towards energy transition. We can move to the next uh, slide, please. And this is a question which is more, uh, it's about the uh, negative influence in the region. Uh, people are asked uh, which country is, uh, is negatively influencing uh, their country's energy choices. And uh, here, uh, there are uh, two findings you see. First of all, that um, uh, the influence of uh, Russia is negatively viewed in most countries minus uh, Serbia, but particularly negatively seen in Albania and in Kosovo. So Alban we see 58% of Albanians uh, replying that uh, Russia exerts a negative influence on the country's choices. 
followed by Kosovo 41%. And on the other hand, in the case of Serbia, we are seeing that uh, they are signing more, they, they are thinking, they are considering that uh, a negative influence is exerted by the United States, is 27%, followed by the EU, and uh, then by the rest of the countries. I would like also that you notice here that uh, although uh, Tena will speak okay. later about this and also uh, Dimitar mentioned it earlier, that uh, China and Turkey are passing below the radar. They are not uh, considered negatively influencing their country's uh, choices, although they have, uh, uh, they have important investments in the region. And uh, this is the next, the next slide, please. This is the last slide I'll show you from this survey, and we'll be happy if there are questions to provide more uh, data uh, from this survey. And this is about um, uh, how our companies, foreign companies, uh, assessed in the region in a scale from positive to negative. So we can have, we have all, uh, we have again the same external actors, the, the EU, other Western countries, the United States, Turkey, China, and Russia. Russia and we're seeing positive or negative assessments. Um, one first finding is that the EU is and the Western countries and uh, Turkey and the United States are positively assessed overall in uh, Albania, in Kosovo, in North Macedonia, uh, and, Bo and Bosnia with the exception of the United States. A second finding is that Montenegro is, um, has milled or negative assessment of any foreign investments. You may notice Montenegro is the light blue column just before the end, it's always here. So it has milled or almost ne or negative assessments of any, of any foreign actor. And uh, we're seeing that uh, Russia's uh, investments are appreciated only in Serbia. This is the last column. Uh, the, 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 sum, the number that you are seeing, 24, is the difference between the deduction between negative and positive assessments. So, uh, so we're seeing that, Serbi that the Russia is positively appreciated only in, uh, in Serbia. And uh, at the same moment, we're, uh, we're seeing that the EU is negatively appreciated in uh, Serbia again, and the other Western countries, and the United States. Uh, uh, this is the same case. So we have a picture of uh, Western corporations being negatively assessed in Serbia, uh, Western corporations being positively assessed in, uh, the, in, in Albania, Kosovo, uh, North Macedonia mainly, a, a, an overall negative uh, overview in Montenegro. And uh, I'll stop here and I'll let Tena to sum up and present some more findings. Thank you. Thank you. So let me just uh, now try to um, think together with you how we might interpret these findings in a more, in a bigger picture. Can I have the next slide, please? So first of all, the good news. Uh, we've seen from the data that Nikos has presented that uh, overwhelmingly the citizens of the Balkans, even in the cases when uh, it is Serbia, even in the cases when uh, they would like the energy supply of their country to be provided by um, actors that bring in fossil fuels, nevertheless, they see uh, their country relying on renewable energy in the time to come. So this is something that is, you know, there is a firm agreement about this, and there is also some appetite for regional cooperation uh, in the, um, uh, for the green energy transition in the region. Um, I mean, I think it bears repeating that the energy transition in the Balkans is an emergency. Um, Dimitar and uh, Florian have mentioned the, uh, the air pollution, but uh, on, the, on the whole, I think many of you will know this, uh, this stat, which is that the 16 carbon-fueled power plants in the Balkans, they pollute more than all the carbon-fueled power plants in the EU combined. So it is indeed something that, you know, that should be a priority. And considering what uh, uh, Dimitar told us about the local elites having in their interest to keep the status quo, uh, the fact that we have uh, populations that are firmly in agreement uh, uh, to go towards a green transition is really good news and also something that policymakers should keep in mind that it's worth investing in this and it's worth uh, uh, basically, you know, um, uh, stimulated, stimul uh, stimulating further the appetite uh, among the populations. Uh, next slide, please. 
So now let's see uh, what those diverging data tell us and those you know, disagreements that uh, Nikos has, has presented. We can see that there is some sort of energy paradox of sorts. Um, we can see that the populations in certain countries where investments are clearly controversial, because uh, in Bosnia, you will know that Chinese investments have been controversial for their environmental impact. Um, you will also be familiar with the fact that uh, in Serbia, Russia has the complete monopoly over oil and gas with a lot of issues in terms of not only the environment, but also governance. Likewise, Turkish investments in the costs of our uh, uh, electricity sector have been um, have raised the controversies about the impact on the public purse. So all these, um, you know, uh, problematic issues have nevertheless not had an impact on the view of people uh, who see uh, these actors as not raising concern, or even sometimes positively. So next slide, please. How come is the question? So a first hypothesis would be that this is simply what's on offer, right? Uh, for instance, in Kosovo, there is not much uh, in terms of investments coming from the West, and therefore the population are happy with what we're getting. So if the Turks are coming and um, you know they're they're providing this uh, this much needed investment, then we should be happy with uh, with what we get. And this is indeed consistent with the positive view of Kosovo and Turkey, of Bosnians uh, towards China, and of Serbs uh, towards Russia. And also, I should add. It's consistent with the fact uh, that the first concern for all um, populations is the economy, right? So it's easy to have this uh, idea that, uh, you know, economic benefit should kind of trump the environment, perhaps. However, there are some inconsistencies, uh, namely the perception of uh, the West uh, in Serbia, which is squarely negative, as we've seen in terms of their environmental impact. Um, for sure, you know, we, we can discuss it later, but uh, uh, for sure, you know, the, the big impact of, uh, of Rio Tinto is something to, to keep in mind. And also of China, again, in the case of Serbia. So although we had uh, issues like uh, uh, both environmental impact and labor rights in Bor, in Smederevo, in Zrenjanin, uh, we see a situation that overall um, there is a slightly negative view of investments, uh, of Chinese investments in, in Serbia. So although, sorry, uh, although the um, actually the narrative that the, the leadership of the country is uh, proposes of, uh, of China and of the investments is squarely positive. So um, this is the first hypothesis, just what's an offer. Um, there is a second one. Can we go to the next slide, please? Which is this idea that we will propose to you of a narrative shield. Um, so in a way, we can see that the overall perceptions of the external actors, uh, as Nikos presented, right, we have the fraught the geopolitical views. We're seeing that they color, that they're reflected on uh, the attitude of people on a sector which is as complicated and technical as energy, uh, towards which people, you know, say, honestly, we don't know much about it. But when asked about the environmental impact, about the uh, impact on energy policies of these actors, it tends very much to reflect those geopolitical views. So in other words, geopolitics matters, yeah? Um, and uh, we see that uh, uh, also, you know, the, if uh, the, um, uh, the, yeah, if we have this kind of uh, narrative shield, uh, these actors might be giving a free pass. And on the contrary, as the image in, in former uh, Serbian tabloid uh, here, um, uh, here shown uh, shows, um, we have a situation in which, you know, some actors are also denigrated, such as the US. So that might help to um, go to the detriment of certain actors, such as the West, the US and the EU in Serbia. Uh, next slide. And this is fully consistent with the data that we see. So um, let's dig deeper into Serbia. As we saw, it was uh, a clear outlier in terms of the uh, geopolitical orientation towards external actors. Uh, we also see uh, that uh, EU, uh, the, uh, the appetite for to join the EU is not that high. Uh, we see that Serbs believe that the EU asks too much and have a positive view towards uh, Russian energy investments. And we also see, and this is quite interesting, that this view is reflected in the Serbian minority in certain neighboring countries, such as Bosnia, Montenegro, and Kosovo as well. So what this tells us is that the 
country's leadership might be getting a free pass because they are managing to, you know, to keep the population in a situation in which they are not reacting to the potentially damaging action of certain uh, actors. Uh, and it also tells us that the transition, energy transition question is hijacked by geopolitical narratives and potentially by disinformation. So how does this work? Um, here is a little a demonstration. Wo chuejen jan yu minien su Thank you. I think we all got the memo, <laughs> the memo. So although we don't understand what the President Vucic is saying, but the point here, <laughs> maybe Russian would be easier. The point here is that uh, there is a clear, you know, propulsion uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, propagation of uh, of a positive attitude towards certain geopolitical actors by certain local elites yeah and we pose this hypothesis to you that this might be reflected in the way that people approach the energy transition question next slide please <laughs> <laughs> thank you alexander so what we are arguing is perhaps, you know, is a further leap uh, in terms of uh, the, the argument that I'm making. And it is that soft power might actually be linked to blockages in the energy transition. How? So we've seen that this narrative shield is mediated through the local gatekeepers that we all mentioned here today. So it's the politicians, but also then, you know, it goes through the media perhaps also the experts and so on and so forth. Uh, so definitely we would like you know, to have and, and see more research into this. So how these narratives are created. It would be important to see not only how they're created, but also when they work and when they don't. A specific puzzle that we pinpointed right now is that for Serbia, it has worked for China, right? So people are uh, well, um, let's say they have a good attitude, a positive attitude towards the Chinese, um, uh, sorry, the Russian role in the green energy transition, but not towards the Chinese role. So that, um, in my view, points also at the role of the resilience of the publics, right? So if uh, people um, are um, get organized and they, um, you know, protest and they make their voice heard, and if the media reflect that, we will have a certain resilience to a possible narrative shield uh, presented by the elites. So this aligns with the theory so far, uh, and it also uh, gives a further substantiation of that uh, um, idea of a synergy of failures between the geopolitical actors and the local elites. Uh, this has been elaborated by uh, Timoni et al. In, uh, in terms of the governance of these uh, investments, so you know of the corruption, of the non-transparency, and so on and so forth. But what we're putting to you today is that this synergy of failures could also be present in a narrative shaping, in the shaping of narratives. So uh, all in all, this could provide one of the few, I would think, uh, substantiation of this potential link that we would have between, you know, soft power that is usually seen as this, uh, um, just, you know, something that is that stays on the surface and that's, that shapes hearts and minds. But we are also, you know, asking ourselves, is it possible it has a link with hard outcomes, meaning in this case of uh, disabling the possibility of publics to act, yeah, against negative influences in the energy transition. Next slide, I will leave you with this now. We'll thank you for your attention and we look forward for your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Nico Centeno. Um, very interesting. Um, and I would now like to open the floor for questions and comments, but to abuse my role as the chair, I will ask maybe um, a first follow-up question to you. So, okay. You have this hypothesis, you have this conclusion of um, the link between soft power and hard outcomes. Um, what does it matter for the EU and what role should the EU play, uh, if any, um, in, in trying to um, resolve this dilemma? Thank you, Karina. So first of all, uh... I think it needs to be said very clearly and very openly that although the EU is investing a lot in the green energy transition in the Balkans, this money pales in comparison to the amount of money that EU member states have at their disposal to fund the green energy transition. 
So first of all, I think, you know, it really needs reminding that uh, if we're serious about it, uh, if the EU is serious about uh, um, the green agenda in the Western Balkans, there needs to be a substantial amount of, uh, you know, uh, support and money going into it. We've seen that there is a take up by the publics potentially that can be much increased, right? Which is now the perception of this threat is, is low, but that the interest is high. Uh, and we see that the local elites are trying to diverge. Basically, you know, they're again um, um, having uh, sitting on two stools and uh, and uh, playing two narratives: one for the EU and another one, basically going more towards keeping the status quo. So, um, you know, uh, aside from the very concrete investment in. Uh, uh, the, the deals uh, that, that should promote this and on the ground. I think what our preliminary findings show is that also um, the area of uh, narratives and of the media should be looked into further and then also counteracted um, in, um, yeah, in ways that, that are relevant to it. Uh, to add, I totally agree with Tena. Uh, there is a slide we did, some slides we have not shown. Um, the... We ask people about the media consumption. Where do they get informed? And we notice that the people who are getting informed via TV or via the radio, which is a local, this is not like the internet where you can read the news from uh, some bizarre guys in Australia, uh, have a more anti-Western uh, opinions, so pro-Russian, you know, in Serbia, than those that get informed via the social networks. So the local mediation, the local elites, and the regime-friendly media do play a role. We, can, we are thinking of follow-up research to see more precisely specific media, but we are seeing people who are more negatively disposed towards the West are informed by the local media. The second thing, and that's why we projected this slide with uh, Tena about uh, their position towards the EU accession, a society that is not so much, that is lukewarm to attain EU accession is uh, convenient for a regime that is not eager to make reforms. So the society is not pressing, requesting fast EU accession. So we can, as Dimitar explained later, slow down or not move quickly with energy transition. Mm -hmm. I know the chance. Yeah, I think the EU should do what it wants to do anyhow to enforce the rule of law. Uh, maybe not enforce it, but just to make sure that they have their rules. Because think about energy transition and, and, and green investment. I mean, you have two investors in an unnamed Balkan country, but one happens to be close to the right people. So their project gets fast-tracked and they get all the permits and licenses. And maybe they also get a long-term contract with uh, the state electricity company for, for at a guaranteed price. But the other investor has no such connections and falls behind. And it might be somebody who brings a more advanced technology. Um, and the, I mean, it's not that the EU can fix those things. We know that there are some limits to how much Brussels can, can deliver, but at least it has to put pressure on governments to guarantee the, 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 the tendering licensing and so on and so forth is done properly. And secondly, that courts, if a dispute lands, for example, I, you apply to me, but I don't give you a license, uh, breaking, <laughs> breaking the law and the regulations that actually the courts and the judge will do their job. So this is the role of the EU to ensure that there's a level playing field and that's not an easy thing to do. Right. I know that there's one question. Yeah. My name is Ivan Lovic. I come from the Serbian National Convention of the EU. Um, actually, I have two questions for you.
right? There was another hand up. Yes, uh, we have a microphone actually, but it's a bit slow. <laughs> Thank you, uh, and thank you for, for doing this research and sharing it with us. My name is Maria Josianius, I work in the European Commission. Um, I agree that it is positive that there seems to be an appetite for regional uh, cooperation, um, but at the same time, I know that Serbia is an outlier in many ways, so can we then expect uh, Serbia to play more ball in the future in this field, at least? <laughs> uh, and then I just wonder a little bit uh, about uh, CBAM, if you will do any particular research on that in the future, because I think this is a game changer. Um, here I no notice, for example, a big interest in, in Serbia, um, as, as it dawns on people that CBAM actually will happen. And either you pay, uh, there will be a fee to be paid at EU borders, or you put a price on carbon in your own country and you get the, you know, co to collect the money instead. Um, so this is, I think, could be a real game changer. I wonder if you are in any way going to look into this. Thank you. All right. Maybe we'll take those questions and then go back again. Um, Dimitar, many of them yeah, were addressed no. directly to you. And Well, the problem of intermittency is, is generic. Everyone who studies energy knows that this uh, the, the sort of objection to, to renewables. But we are thinking about the situation now. In the future, in five, ten years, it need not be that because, first of all, we have much more efficient uh, energy storage technologies. Uh, for instance, just the past couple of weeks, we've seen big projects in Romania with OV Petrom, which is the biggest refinery in the region, investing into hydrogen. Greece is pretty much advanced as well. And that's one thing. Also, there's batteries, so battery factories. I know it might be a bit sensitive in Serbia because of lithium, uh, but that's the technology. And uh, if you have storage, then this issue of intermittent supply is sort of um, tackled to an extent. So the second uh, way to deal with it is through regional integration. So if the wind is not blowing somewhere, uh, other parts of the region might have the, the dams full uh, to, to an extent, so you can balance the system that way. And you think about scale, it's not just the Western Balkans. The Western Balkans need not be fought differently from the rest of the EU, but also Turkey, I, I, I'd say. So uh, the, the answer is technolo technological uh, change and scale. On LNG, I think Alexandropolis is the most realistic option. Because Azeris will have problem to scale up their output, um, whatever they, they tell people in the Balkans, um, Shagdan is um, as a certain limit. And of course, it's popular to think about Azerbaijan. The other energy terminals, there is a problem of connectivity, which is not there with Alexandropolis, because Alexandropolis will be online and also the interconnector with Bulgaria, which is partly sponsored by the EU as well, uh, will be online as well. Um, the problem is not availability of gas. I think there'll be plenty of it, especially given that the consumption needs are pretty low. The question is the price you pay. So it will be economical to import LNG, mm -hmm. will be uh, feasible. Uh, if not, um, how much you have to subsidize. And in Serbia, the gas will basically go for district heating. This is what you need. You don't need it for electricity. I mean, same in North Macedonia, where Skopje, the, the Skopje uh, district heating plant is probably by far the biggest cons consumer. So th I think that's, that's one issue. What would be uh, LNG uh, in terms of price levels in a few years' time? Because LNG uh, producers want also long-term contracts. I mean, they, they want you... If, if Vucic comes to Qatar tomorrow, which probably he will, and the Qataris will say, that's fine, Serbia is a small market, so you have to pay a premium and you have to commit over a longer uh, period of time, which brings us back to renewables, because renewables are abundant and they they, they are in, in the region. And that's why I'm saying is gas might be okay as a re transition fuel, but it's not, it has full carbon footprint, it's not efficient, it's politically sensitive, it involves in investment on, on, on a big scale. I mean, X number of, of issues associated uh, with gas. And I, I don't think there's a huge future 
Um, also, I mean, the reason gas is needed in places like Germany, not just because of the the market is the, the size of the, the market is that electricity is produced from gas. This is the backup fuel, and also people have in Western Europe have gas in their homes. So there is this extra demand. And it's not changing in the Balkans. I don't see a mass campaign going in Belgrade and Novi Sad or whatever, and people installing boilers. That's not likely to happen. So again, one message here is it's fine to debate gas, but let's think about the big picture and where renewables comes in. And, and let's talk a bit less about Serbia gas. Let's talk a bit more about EPS, uh, the electricity company, which of course is hugely important, touches on every host, household, it's badly mismanaged. There are lots of political interests. I mean, if you tackle that, then uh, you do some stuff. Um, on CBAM, yeah, I agree. It's, it's It will be a big game changer because the moment it comes in, then this electricity generated from coal won't be competitive anymore. And now it is competitive because it's so cheap in the Western Balkans. If if you have a power plant in Greece that has to pay uh, for its emissions uh, and another one that is based on offshore wind or, or, or solar, um, then of course the coal-based plant is, is not in the game anymore. That's not the case in Bosnia or Serbia or, uh, or even Kosovo. Um, yeah, I wanted to address the question about uh, Serbia, whether you can take a more active role from a, a perspective of uh, the public perception. And I think there are several issues there for Serbia to remark. So first of all, um, the narrative proposed by, um, by President Vucic uh, has been for a long time economy over everything else. And he said it very clearly back, I think it was in 2015, 2016, that uh, um, he said it during an interview that, you know, uh, the environmentally damaging uh, Chinese investment were not su uh, such a concern because the economy was the first one for him. Um, and for the country. So uh, if, you, if you look at how his ascent uh, to power worked, uh, the issue of uh, economic uh, um, you know, ruin in the country and uh, how his um, party is going to rebuild uh, the country economically has been front and center all the time. And the foreign investors were part of this uh, uh, narrative because through them, he could take the mantle of the savior and say, look, my friends coming to the rescue are going to rescue us from economic ruin. And therefore, you know, this uh, narrative of the economic salvation was front and center. And, and as we've seen from the these data, as well as other surveys, to a certain extent, it did work. So, you know, people did believe uh, in the fact that we need uh, more money, we need to uh, strengthen the economy. And so this is the priority. Um, however, we also have another issue, which is that the uh, Western investments that have been in the public eye so far have uh, not been successful. Why? Uh, on the one hand, we have the small hydropower plants, um, which were again co-opted by the regime, meaning that, you know, were again used as a way to distribute clientelistic favors. Um, this is something that got uh, into, into the news, as well as the um, potential, you know, impact on the environment, on the rivers, on the mountains, and so on and so forth. So that was seen as something that was, was not positive mediated through the state, but still, you know, uh, basically sub, uh, um, subventions coming from the EU, but mediated through the state. But what was seen even worse was, of course, the Rio Tinto investment uh, in, in lithium. And this has sparked huge protests. Uh, we see that reflected here in the in the survey clearly. And uh, I think, you know, in, in the minds of, of even the more, more progressive Serbs, you don't have anything for them to rally around to say, look, this is a good Western investment in the field of energy. Yeah. So if you're asking, you know, what, what, whether there is a role there for, for Serbia in this moment, I don't see it because it's basically it's blocked even the potential for even those actors that are minded, uh, you know, to to um, work towards a more European future to say, look, this is a positive that is coming from from the West, this is a positive is coming from the EU. So I do believe that if uh, there was something recognizable and recognizable investment in the field of renewables, that you might, you know, flip the narrative and uh, and go towards a more, towards unlocking this potential which exists. 
one remark, Tana, however, that uh, that comes to my mind before I pass the floor to uh, Nikos. Um, of course, when it comes to the economy, though, the EU remains uh, a huge partner for the region, including for Serbia, and I mean, trade and banking and everything. Uh, uh, so, so it's not that um, the EU is not an important economic actor. And so um, then, of course, the question uh, comes, why is it still perceived as uh, having less uh, uh, of a positive role than, than Russia or, or simply overlooked? Yeah, indeed. I mean, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a question of perceptions rather than of real investment. You're absolutely right that most of foreign investment comes from uh, from the West. But the way that it was, you know, publicized in the media and uh, what sparked the most uh, controversies was unfortunately a Western one. So it's it's kind of, you know, it's about uh, countering these these perceptions. So once again, you know, I think that aside from... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Rio Tinto being, I think, an Australian Canadian company, but there is also this perception that Germany is pushing for this, right? So that's why it's put into that that basket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll get back to the question of regional cooperation and Serbia's role, generally regional cooperation. There is, in fact, some regional cooperation, but it is um, directed on, as Dimitar mentioned, or interconnectors inter or pipelines or bringing gas uh, to all the region. But uh, there is a problem here, and most of these projects uh, seek for EU funds and many of them will be financed. The problems are many, as Dimitar mentioned, A, that uh, if all these projects are implemented, they they are much larger than the, the needs of the region. The region needs only 4 billion cubic meters of gas, so they are they are not they are not do not correspond to expect to the expectations. But the most important problem is that these projects may end up at the end coming at the expense of energy transition because it's the same money that goes to to interconnect us and they're not uh, assigned uh, to, to solar or uh, wind uh, 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 projects. And uh, at the end of the day, maybe due to the war, we may be putting the short-term interest with energy security and um, and uh, getting uh, 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 and uh, stopping dependence on Russia uh, against the long-term interest, which is a clear move towards uh, renewable energy. Mm -hmm. okay. I want to pick, on, pick up on something Tana said about Rio Tinto. Because I see a danger uh, in the coming years. It's not here yet, but it uh, it will appear. The moment the EU actually ups pressure on on renewables, there will be call for malign narratives. Mm -hmm. Something along the lines: uh, EU wants us to close those power plants that provide employment and cheap electricity, and they they want to sell us expensive renewable generated. Uh, electricity that, by the way, profit uh, profits go to Western investors. I mean, it will be a gold mine for wh whatever propagandists will be. I mean, we've seen examples in other countries, in member states. It's not yet the case because the Western vocals is not in the spotlight, but I'm sure it will come up and we'll be discussing it. Who are the, yeah. Okay, we have four. Uh, we'll take those four uh, questions and then uh, we will close. Um, I believe Surgeon was first, so. Thank you very much. Uh, Sergio Mestorovic, um, Center for European Policy, Belgrade. Um, I, I think um, that there are some good news out of this uh, research, and I was particularly impressed by the, the slide which says that overwhelming majority of citizens in the region um, are aware of necessity uh, to invest more in uh, renewables. This is something which is a good basis for, for, for the continuation. Uh, it's, it seems that citizens are aware of the risks. Uh, um, I guess uh, the major motivating factor was a fear, uh, but I would be very much interested if you touched upon different aspects that uh, influence this opinion of, of citizens or are you planning to do so uh, in the future that, uh, that led to this uh, notion? Um, that would be very, very valuable to, to research and, and to, to have data. And a small remark, overall, it seems that whenever we talk about uh, a big policies, such as public health, such as uh, energy, climate changes, it seems that the major problem is the captured state phenomenon in the, in the region. 
uh, or the gatekeepers, as, as you're referring to them in your, in your research. Um, I'm quite positive that one of the ways to ad address these issues is, uh, as Nikos mentioned, a much more European investments in the, in the area. This is going to be needed. The green transi transition is very expensive public investment. And it is obvious that countries in the region are not going to be able to invest uh, uh, by themselves. But this will create a new opportunity for the very same gatekeepers uh, to chip in. And uh, while listening to your presentation, uh, my colleague and I were joking, saying that when we recognize that people who are connected to the regime in Serbia start uh, opening their companies for the uh, you know, import of solar panels, then we would know that Serbia is on the path to the great green green trans transition. Um, <clears throat> exactly. And uh, so the, the EU has to be present with its money in order to support that. It's a common interest. It's not the interest of the region exclusively. But again, it needs to come with a, with a, with a, with a clear notion how to avoid the corruption and how to maintain uh, uh, clear conditions for these uh, big investments to be implemented. We can have, you know, allow them to chip in at the beginning just to have this, you know, confirmation that the process started and then to implement <laughs> EU. These investments should also have to. Thank you. It will be very short because uh, Ten already addressed some uh, issues that I wanted to raise. My name is Bojana Selkovic. I'm from National Convention on European Union uh, in uh, Serbia. So uh, my intention was uh, also to, to raise uh, the case of Rio Tinto. It's definitely elephant in the room when it comes to energy. Uh, even uh, all, all those uh, topics uh, are very important. Uh, those findings are not new for us from Serbia, but it's, you know, they are very illustrative when we see that kind of uh, connections. And also in in, um, in terms of uh, perception uh, among uh, general public, I have to, to say that this case Rio Tinto is also very important because uh, it actually uh, opened completely new perspective uh, for activists, for civil society, uh, but also for uh, for some political uh, actors um, uh, and open mining industry as, as, as a sector issues related to mining industry before, before Rio Tinto. Uh, actually, we didn't have, um, I don't know, organizations, individuals, experts who tackled mining in general in, in, in Serbia. Uh, but now, you know, all of them are uh, aware of different aspects and influences of the mining industry uh, in general. Uh, so in that regard, uh, lithium, as you uh, uh, could see, uh, was a, a topic for, uh, for, for, for the society polarization. Uh, I think uh, and, uh, uh, very similar like Kosovo in, in, in Serbian society and uh, for the future. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, we need some uh, new approaches uh, whenever uh, someone wants to, to, to raise not only uh, uh, the, the, uh, the case of lithium as well, but in general, I think that case uh, affected, um, affected green uh, transition in Serbia, uh, not only because of you know, the situation in Serbia, but uh, perception is that lithium is needed for people who live in EU countries, so they will be, uh, they, they will have you know a, a clear uh, uh, environment using our lithium, and we will uh, stay uh, uh, here as a kind of uh, you know just uh, 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 explore uh, for, for we will serve for the exploration of resources, and that's very important. It's not topic now. Uh, but definitely, uh, I think uh, that topic could be raised again and will be used for further uh, polarization and also strengthening some uh, right-wing uh, 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 narratives in, in the society.
my questions on the table at least, uh, Andre the Middle European Parliament. Uh, I would be interested in having your views on how to in practice uh, enforce rule of law conditionality in particular when we are dealing with projects of regional cooperation where you might think of targeting one specific country but regional cooperation in, of course implies between countries and you would like to spare one but be harsh on the other one. And then I'm also thinking of uh, what is happening now, the political bickering and blackmail in Bosnia-Herzegovina on the southern and eastern gas interconnector, where regional cooperation uh, can easily uh, turn into uh, regional obstructionism, which it's act is actually the case now for political agendas. And sorry if I have to run into... Thank you. Um, thank you for to all of you for this fascinating presentation as well. My name is Seraphine Dinkel. I'm a research fellow at the Institute for European Studies at the ULB here in Brussels. Um, my question would be to Tena and, and Nikolaus. Um, I I really like this uh, this hypothesis on this narrative shield that is being employed by certain gatekeepers. I'm wondering if um, this narrative is something that is just addressed in your opinion to a domestic audience or whether there is also an extent to which these narratives are used strategically also towards the outside also towards a european commission that might have uh, more geopolitical interests in these questions nowadays thanks Thanks. Uh, I want to answer to speak to two questions. Um, the one which has been raised in the context of the Rio Tinto protests, as well as I think also, you know, there have been substantial protests across the region against small hydroelectric power plants, um, which were often done uh, in a way which was disruptive to the environment in natural parks from Albania to Kosovo to Serbia uh, and Bosnia. Um, and I think the problem which we see with that is that often the line between legitimate environmental protests, which are very important, and kind of nimbyism um, is, is often not very clear. I mean, NIMBY is not in my backyard. And I think the problem is that um, citizens don't trust governments uh, across the region, and for good reason. I mean, we've talked about the, 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 the lack of the rule of law. And the problem is that you know how to make the, the transition the energy transition in a way that citizens trust their governments actually that they actually do genuinely good projects um for for you know whether it's hydroelectric or uh, or wind or solar power which actually is good um and i think this is part of the problem um how to manage this with a, in a low trust environment and i think this is going to be probably one of the biggest challenges at least with the current constellation of government beyond the abuse uh, of rule of law but can you actually do the transition transition if you have citizens who are going to mobilize against any project for legitimate worries about whether the governments are sincere in their projects and in their execution. And the second point, I want to kind of speak to the question about the narrative shield. I think that is certainly deployed also towards a lot of it is about extracting concessions from the European Union and Western governments. A lot of it is exactly about having the alternative you can offer. But I think one thing which is also I think comes clear from the survey is that, you know, these are these are not given and narratives. These are constructed narratives, so they can also be deconstructed, and they also are not, you know, they've been built. I mean, China has not had a particularly positive image or any image until a few years ago, and it's, you know, the speeches and other ones which in a short time have sought to create that image but again it's 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 driven by local gatekeepers it's not driven by the external actors so the gatekeepers determine um the image rather than any other way around. What is also what also seems interesting is that uh, people don't trust their governments, but they still fall for their propaganda. <laughs> Bit of a paradox there. Don't I? I've spoken for too, way too much. So I have just one small remark to respond to something Sirjan said that uh, basically green policies are very costly. Well, they're not anymore. Uh, I'll give you an example. Poland. Um, nearly doubled its renewable capacity over the past one, two years. Why is that the case? Because cheap solar panels that everyone can put on their rooftops. Uh, same thing can happen at the level of small companies as well. Um, and you become what the people in the trade call prosumer. You're consuming, but also you're feeding when you have excess uh, capacity uh, to, to the grid. 
Uh, and there is no reason why that shouldn't be possible in the Western Balkans, where you have enough solar, you have enough wind, you have geothermal as well. Uh, what needs to happen is to, to have policy leadership and legislative change. But then you have the problem with vested interests, and it's not that easy to uh, to take off. But I have no doubt that eventually there will be some fraction, because the bottom line is that your bill is likely to decrease. And if the world spreads, even in a policy environment, which is sort of congested and you have a gatekeeping issue, basically citizens and consumers will revolve with their pockets. Uh, and we will see some of that uh, happening. So we don't, don't think about huge wind parks or big installations. Think about small scale as well. So, thank you very much for the great questions. About the narrative shield, yes, as uh, Florian mentioned, it's definitely something that is also addressed at, uh, uh, at the outset, not only to a domestic audience, um, in two ways. One is showing, look, we have also other options, and, you know, if you don't want us in the EU, we do have here, we have China, we have Russia, we have the Emirates, we have Turkey. And this kind of works, actually, because the West has framed the Balkans in such a geopolitical way, with such a geopolitical chessboard, that actually this Russia scare is what works to gain their attention, unfortunately. And it's what, you know, we are trying to kind of nuance and deconstruct also in our, our scholarship. And the second way is by creating and potentiating a constituency to the right. Yeah. So what is happening in Serbia, what used to be happening in Montenegro or, or maybe still is, is also to a certain extent to, you know, fuel some uh, uh, animosities and fuel uh, a constituency of voters, which those in the center, the leaders will be able to show it. Look, if you don't want us, uh, you will get somebody even worse. Right. So uh, kind of presenting themselves as the uh, guarantors of stability. Um, uh, then uh, uh, to Sergeant's question, so uh, what influences their stances? I mean, uh, of course, it's beyond the scope of this research. And uh, do we need more research? Yes, of course we do. So please fund it. <laughs> and, uh, and about the state capture um, element, I absolutely agree. And uh, that's why uh, I really think that these two, you know, the environmental question and the uh, and the governance question need to be looked at in conjunction. It's been shown over and over again, not only in the Balkans, you know, you name it, Nigeria, Chile, and so on and so forth. You need to look at these two. And, uh, and you know, if you, if you promote the virtuous circle together, I think the results will be much, much better than just going on one side or the other. Uh, and finally, Boyana, a really good point about um, uh, also, you know, the way Rio Tinto has uh, tuned into a narrative of, of neocolonialism uh, in, uh, in the country. We just had a panel at the, um, the Association of Studio Nationalities Convention in uh, New York now where we discussed this. So basically how these uh, protesters have also, um, and these, this narrative has fueled uh, this grievance about being colonized by the West. And this can be used by some right-wing actors. And again, you know, uh, an alternative in opposition to the uh, ruling elite, which is perhaps even less, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, palatable for the West. So it's definitely something that the EU doesn't want. And therefore, there should be very careful in promoting further uh, such investments, because this is exactly what they'll, they'll get, because the impression will be we're colonized, this is neocolonialism, and uh, and it will keep fueling these uh, these narratives. And just finally, again, on Boyana's point, uh, you know, I was uh, interested in hearing that uh, uh, this uh, also um, organization of uh, activists and of uh, uh, um, organizing around the mining industry and regulating it has, uh, um, has grown out of these protests. So perhaps we could say that, after all, there was some positive influence from the West in this case. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, thanks. Uh, I'll ask to certain to hear the question whether we can explain uh, these findings. And there'll be specific, we have tried to, to put into play factors such as education, uh, generation, age, party affiliation, ethnic, uh, ethnicity dimension. I'll give just an example. There was a question that you mentioned that um, uh, Sixty-one percent of Serbs in Serbia believe that uh, the country should receive energy by 2050 by renewable source of energy. Uh, 
Now, if we move to the question, if we split in education, lower education and the higher education, the pro-renewables in the lower education is 29%, in the higher education, 73%. So the answer here is not to send everybody to the universities, but clearly in a such a technical question, we need more awareness raising, more information to the public. So if the public is more informed, you can expect that there will be a greater support in the society uh, for, uh, for, uh, for renewable energy. Uh, I won't go into detail into party affiliation because uh, the electorate of a, of a party does not necessarily reflect the opinion of their leaders, but we may say, I may just stop here and say that there are huge differentials between the main uh, two parties in uh, North Macedonia, the voters of SDSM and VMRO, and also in Serbia between SNS and UZPS. So we may imagine if the electorates really reflect the discourse of their leaders, that the political change in either of these two countries, in North Macedonia is very likely for next year, can imply a change of direction. In that case, I'm afraid it might be negative as far as uh, uh, or external orientation is concerned. Thank you, and I can say that uh, there's huge differences in Bosnia in the Bosnian case yeah. as well. Um, <clears throat> right, we have come to the end. Thank you so much for your attention and your active participation, and many many thanks to our speakers for their fascinating um, insights. And the conversation, as I say said at the beginning, can continue now because there's a small reception waiting for you outside. Thank you very much. Oh. And please stay tuned because there's more to come out in terms of content from, from this work with case studies uh, and a policy brief at, at the very end. Thank you. <laughs>